as a young person, when I heard somebody mention about the Buddha or some teaching of the Buddhas, I felt really like to stop to contemplate that, that this is something important and worthy of paying attention to. By the time I was in university, in pre-med, uh, someone brought up the Buddha's Four Noble Truths. This was in the context of discussing medicine and about suffering and like what is the cause of human suffering and then the, the proposition that the cause of suffering can be really truly known and can be understood and that suffering can be ended. When I heard uh, this teaching on the Four Noble Truths, it had such kind of gravitas for me that I felt really just like, almost like the whole world just stopped and came to a standstill and it got my full attention. Later on, uh, then a friend of uh, my family had gone to Thailand, then found out about the opportunity to ordain as a bhikkhu for three months. I, as a young teenager, then said, you know, can I do that too? <laughs> I want to do that too. But then he told me that it was possible for him as a man, but that he did not think that women could do that. I thought, but wait, the original teaching and original way of life has both the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, the the, like fully ordained male and female monastics. So then, what happened? And this understanding what happened has been a really big part of my life and my study and my work. My mother actually was the first fully ordained nun, not in Theravada, but in Mahayana, and she was already running a temple. There are these qualities which I mentioned, and you will see that the world... I happened to be her only child, so everyone was expecting that I should continue this temple. I keep pushing it. To lead a monastic life, you have to come with a 100% commitment and I was not ready. I finished my education both in Canada and India with my thesis on comparative study of the monastic rules of the fully ordained nuns. I was the first Thai woman who actually came back with degree in religion. So then I continued teaching in Thammasat University for 27 years in the Department of Philosophy and Religion. During that time, I was already hosting this Dharma program. Before that, it's only monks and it's only male who would teach Buddhism through television. And I was quite accustomed to that kind of life. One day when I was Putting on makeup, I look in the mirror at my own self, at my own reflection, and suddenly there was a question that came in my mind saying that, how long do I have to do this? It was, I was stunned, you know, like it's about time, it's about time you make a decision. All of the Buddhist ancient texts agree that the Buddha himself founded the bhikkhu and bhikkhuni sankhas. At some time, often said to be uh, around a thousand years ago or so, then some branches of the women's monastic tradition, the bhikkhuni sankha, died out at least we can say in, in Sri Lanka and perhaps in Southeast Asia as well. When I was a young person then, 
entering into Buddhism, the situation was that there were almost no bhikkhunis in, in Theravada Buddhism. There were women who had practiced in the Theravada traditions of South and Southeast Asia who had ordained via East Asian traditions because that's what was available up until that time. So in 1996 and 1998, there were a larger number of women from Sri Lanka, also from India and other countries than from Theravada traditions who received bhikkhuni ordination uh, with the support of East Asian traditions in India with the aim to revive the Theravada uh, bhikkhuni Sankhas. And then from 1998 in Sri Lanka, Theravada form bhikkhuni ordinations started again. Then from the year 2002 and 2003, then there are women from Southeast Asia, Southern Vietnam, and also Thailand, also from Burma who started to go to Sri Lanka to receive bhikkhuni ordination. When I came back, for the first time, they heard of women being ordained. So the reaction was quite strong. I was on the media, you know, one particular newspaper for two months. There were lots of negative vibrations going around. The Buddha was the one who established fourfold Buddhist. Fourfold Buddhist meaning Piku, fully ordained monk, Pikuni, fully ordained women, laymen and laywomen. And in our country, we don't have fully ordained nun. Women do not have role model, do not have religious role model, which is very important. The body of monks is like a triangle, uh, and the top, top part of the triangle is this uh, cabinet, which is called Council of Elders. When we were ordained, this Council of Elders made a pronouncement that they do not accept because we are not recognized by this Council of Elders. So therefore, the government also do not recognize us. So when I was in Malaysia attending the Sakyadita conference in 2006 in Kuala Lumpur, I met Thai bhikkhunis. They had recently, very recently ordained. But when I met them, I was stunned at the situation in Thailand. And I really began to learn about what they were going through to become established. The first Bikuni I met was in the early 1990s, Ayakama. I uh, set up a nunnery in Sri Lanka. I set up a meditation center in Germany. And she was very powerful, influential. She was um, one of the founders of Sakya Dita, which was an international organization to help women who wanted to ordain. So I have Ayakema, powerful, influential, traveling around the world, access to all this teaching, well supported. And then, what? I see these three tiny bhikkhunis. It's like somebody threw a bucket of cold water on me. Like, this is not computing. How could people who call themselves Buddhists allow this to happen? Did they not know that they were misrepresenting the intentions of the Buddha? So tell us about your home. Tell us how your kuti was constructed. And that's when I began my education. 
on what's happening in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, Burma, Myanmar, Sri Lanka. สิบยี่สิบปีมานี้ก็มีสตรีอยากจะบวชมันมีข้อแม้อยู่ข้อหนึ่งว่าการจะบวชเป็นภิกษุณีนั้นต้องให้ภิกษุณีบวชให้ก
with so little support. Just 20 people as our first supporters in just a tiny rented place. In the beginning, people said to me when we decided to start, they were afraid that there wouldn't even be support for even three months of living on alms without someone having a job or uh, having some great patron or this kind of thing. They thought people are not used to supporting the nuns. And they, they support the bhikkhus, but they're just not enculturated to supporting the, the nuns. You know, when we are living in America, our Asian devotees, Thai, Sri Lankan, especially Theravada countries devotees, they take care of us very well. They provide food, they provide our rope, they provide necessary everything to poor us. Unfortunately, they don't do the same way to the nun. Our society not yet supporting the bhikkhuni, that is very sad thing. We have to start to help them. Bhikkhuni order very, very important today in this world. When I ordain here over around 35 to 40 bhikkhunis, they have to take care of themselves. They don't have a monastery like I do have here. Other male bhikkhus have the temple they don't have. Some of our nuns stay in the forest area. It is uh, not easy for them, very far, very forest areas, uh, not much facilities. They stay there because they love the sasana, they want to practice. There are certainly challenges and there are also solutions. I feel like starting a vihara in the San Francisco Bay Area um, is quite doable because there are a lot of people interested in the Dhamma and they're interested in, in women um, doing well. Uh, the bhikkhunis don't get anything. We get a fraction of the support bhikkhus get. But it's enough. And I feel like this life is a life based on faith. And if you really practice and you move forward and you're determined, then support comes. And it's not like you're doing it for the support, you're just sharing the Dhamma. And since becoming a bhikkhuni, it's possible to help other women realize that they too can live uh, this kind of spiritual life and giving them more places where they can ordain. And there are a number of women who call or write or visit who are interested in trying to find their way to deeper spiritual practice and it could take any form. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to try to help them see where they belong maybe at another bhikkhuni monastery or maybe in a different form. How does one, if one finds oneself falling out of mindfulness, how can one counter that? Everybody loses mindfulness. You know, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing effort to observe what the mind is doing and keep coming back to the Dhamma channel. <laughs> I think it is, um, important to um, have female monastics, have that access to female monastics. Um, I come from a really male-dominated uh, industry and I didn't want to repeat that, you know, some of the same issues that I found in my industry. Many women feel more comfortable talking with bhikkhunis, but so do a lot of men. And what are they looking for? They're looking for peace, for relief, 
from suffering. I ordain here men and women, almost uh, 15 men. Most of them uh, take off robe, but on the other hand, I ordain over 30 nuns. Uh, the, most of them are remain nuns. Uh, some of them are writing, some of them are teaching meditation, some of them are themselves practicing meditation, some of them are doing services, temples, and some of them are counseling those other things they are doing. Hmm? Common folks easily approach none than monk. Whenever any woman has any problems, family matters, they shy, they do not want to talk to the man, monk. มีมีข้อดีมั้ยอ่ะค่ะในในในด้านนี้อ่ะค่ะก็นี่ตัดไปได้เลยเพราะว่าการที่ภิกษุนี้เข้าถึงประชาชนได้ดีกว่านี่
it's a shame, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say it's a shame because we as Thai women would very much want to be ordained by the Thai monks themselves. It costs society which is not balanced, particularly women. When women do not have role model in, in religion, do not have role model in spiritual contexts, what can you expect? What can you expect your granddaughters would grow up in? You know, if your granddaughters can grow up in a setting where they can see women in religious role, in spiritual role, would it be better? Yeah, this is, it's just a question that we need to ask ourselves. I started to feel like, as the Buddha has said, like a farmer cultivating the fields and talking about fields of merit. You know, if the field is rocky and not cultivated well, only a very few seeds of great resilience will be able to grow. But for what the Buddha himself established, it's like called a well-cultivated field of merit. It's like take out all the rocks and till that field very well and then many of the seeds, which means many people, many people, diverse people, then in that well-tilled environment will find ground and nurturance and be able to grow up. I had a moment in Bangkok, on the street corner in Bangkok, then seeing the small Bodhi tree, little wee tender Bodhi tree, coming up through the crack in the side of the road. And with it coming up, then it's making that crack wider, yes? Then I saw the city bus, like over it, and it just, like, just missed to go over that Bodhi tree. Little baby, I saw myself at that time, that year, then maybe, 2002 in Bangkok, not many bhikkhunis in Thailand at that time. And how fragile, how precarious this situation was in a way. I thought from my growing up bigger, uh, my, if my Bodhi tree <laughs> grows up bigger, then if that can open the crack larger such that others are also able to come through and grow up, then that would be good. So I thought, let me at least see what I can do to open up the cracks a little bit wider and a few more, a few more can get through and then this starts to become less like a rock wall, less like pavement and more like truly like a field that's able to nurture and support and give ground to what we think is the greatest merit in this world.